I think perhaps we're going to start with John, John D. Liu's um, introduction that he has prepared for us today. Welcome, John. I'm very excited to have John here. John has been doing a bit of um, much needed rest and relaxation travel and time with his family lately, and he is joining us today from Beijing. So it's always it's always good to connect with, with John and have him here. Um, I really just wanted to, to, to welcome everyone to, to the Spire Site Chat. Um, we have taken a break over the summer, or depending on which part of the world you're in, perhaps it's, it's winter, it was winter for you, it was certainly winter for me, but fortunately the earth has turned and it's now time for us to go into summer down south, which is much appreciated and welcomed after a very long and cold, and cold winter. My name is Kath. For those of you who haven't met me before, I'm the communications coordinator at Ecosystem Restoration Communities. I'm usually in the back end, but this evening or today, I have the pleasure of joining you in the in the driving seat alongside John and, and Bob, and it's good to be here. You can probably tell from my, my accent that I am not from the north. I am from Cape Town, actually, in, in South Africa. Um, and if you if you find my accent difficult to follow, feel free to ask questions in the chat. Um, but rest assured, I won't be doing most of the talking uh, today, so all is not lost. Um, we're really happy this evening to be sharing some good news with you and some stories of hope, really, especially at a time when there's just so much devastation and and despair in the world. So really lovely to have you all here. And I think that I'm going to um, kick off with John's video. So just give me one second while I get that up and running. Just returned to Beijing yesterday in the evening, and tonight it's a fireside chat. We're excited about the opportunity to learn about the camp in Kenya, and soon we'll be hearing about that. But I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who's listening out there and especially to all the people in the different camps and communities all around the world who are working to restore ecological function in their localities. Personally, I'm very thankful to the Common Land Foundation and the Mustard Seed Trust who allow me to continue to do this work. And I'm very grateful to you for coming because more and more people need to learn about and to participate in large-scale ecological restoration on a planetary scale. We are facing, as I guess if you're here, you understand, quite serious challenges from climate change, from disruptions to the hydrology, to massive changes in uh, desertification around the world and we know a lot about this and we know how to change it and it takes everybody's understanding and everybody's effort to do this work 
So you've come to the right place. And we're also seeing that at this time we need to consider peace. One of the things that I think about a lot, and especially in these last few days, with the situation in Israel and Palestine, and before that in Ukraine and Russia, and throughout the time in Libya and in Afghanistan and in the Sudan and in Lebanon and all around the world, really. There's historical inequities and there are conflicts that remain unresolved for a very long time. And I think that ecosystem rest camps and communities can be very helpful in, in addressing what are happening in only can we restore soils and restore hydrology and restore biodiversity, but I think we can restore peace if we get everybody involved and engaged in restoration, then there's more value and more kindness and more fun in doing that than having disruptions to the society, having classes, entire masses of people who are, who are left out of the society and can't survive and are driven to extremes. So we need to take care of everyone so that everyone can live a joyous and abundant life on the earth. I look forward to learning about the camp in Kenya now and to get to know and to work with all of you around the world in restoring the earth and the human spirit. Thanks so much for listening. Okay, thank you so much, John, for that for that message. We look forward to being able to engage further with you after the fireside chat. Just a reminder to those folk who are new to the format, once we've had the presentation by the restoration community, there's a wonderful open Q&A session. We'll start with the questions that are more focused on the actual presentation so that Bob can have a chance to respond. And if he doesn't know the answers because none of us profess to know everything, then somebody else from the floor, or possibly John, or probably John will be able to respond. And thereafter we delve into a more general Q&A just around anything that might be on your heart or mind about ecosystem restoration, questions you may have, concerns, uh, exciting things you'd like to share with us. So the format will be quite open after the formal uh, chat-based um, Q&A. But before we start talking to Bob, which is I know the reason why all of you have signed in today to actually be with us, I just have a few exciting announcements that I'd like to share from the movement. Um, so I'm going to get to those now. Right. It might be good to ask everyone to mute once more because I, I can still hear a few people. Thank you for that, John. Yes. Can you all see my, my screen? Yeah, fabulous. Okay, so a couple of other things in addition to muting, if you could hold your questions until after the presentation, you can certainly put your questions so long in the chat. They will be noted. My colleague, Melissa Lacoste is sitting in the back end. <clears throat> sitting in Paris, but you're sitting in the back end of this conversation, and she will be taking down all your questions. During the actual Q&A session, you're welcome to stick up your hand and by using the hand emoji and ask your questions in person, 
but if you're shy like me, you can just pop them into the chat and we'll pick them up that way. And, and then I've mentioned the, the, the session goes on schedule for one hour, but you know we're here, we're welcome and happy to stay afterwards to, to chat about anything else that you'd like to. I really want to start with some opportunities, really, for, for you, our supporters and our followers. The first one is taking place on Saturday, the 11th of November, and that is the Earth event. Earth is a newish organization, and they are going to be holding their first ever Earth Summit at London's iconic Barbican. And this event will bring together over 30 global experts and practitioners around regenerative living, um, ecosystem restoration restorers, public figures, media partners, aligned organizations. There's an incredible lineup. And as an official impact partner to the event, ecosystem restoration communities will also be there. So really, if you are going to be in London over that time, um, we invite you to come through, sign up for the event. Melissa will be sharing shortly the link to sign up for this Earth event, the summit. And our very own John Liu and Ashley will be there speaking about the movement on the day. So please come over and say hi at our store. Then the next uh, event I wanted to draw your attention to, if you're in Ireland or more specifically in County Monaghan, there is a regenerative agriculture taking place in November. All the dates mentioned there are Tuesdays, and it's taking place mm -hmm. on site at, um, at, at sorry, at Shelter Creek, the ecosystem restoration community in Ireland. And the particular agriculture course is going to be focusing on regenerative agriculture, oh. things like income inequality. Sausage roll, please. If I could ask, uh, I think Christopher, just to mute because we're hearing you in the background. Oh, um, but it's all about how do we create a nutrient rich food for the community and a fair wage for the farmer. And this course is really designed to give participants an overview of knowledge of key aspects regarding regenerative agriculture. Then, excitingly, they're all exciting, but I'm particularly excited about this one, and that's that our very own director, Peter van der Kaag, who is present here, um, you can actually ask some questions, I'm sure, afterwards about this. He is going to be presenting at a TEDx event at Wageningen University in the Netherlands, and that is on Saturday the 18th of November. I'm not sure exactly what time of the day Peter's presentation is. Peter, perhaps you could pop that in the in the, the chat for us, but the whole event kicks off at 10.30 in the morning and runs until 6 p.m. You do need to pre-book for this event. And as you know, with TEDx Talks, they are high in demand. There are limited seats available. So if you happen to be finding yourself in the Netherlands in November, see if you can stick around for the 18th and get to Wageningen for that presentation. And um, Peter will be speaking particularly on the theme of this year's event, which is tradition in transition. And the event, uh, the whole theme is going to be broaching the topic of how to continue living on this planet with responsibility and with agency um, towards people, places and ideas around us and the world in general. Peter's going to be unpacking particularly the topic of can we make our room to live on this planet larger? Can we make our room larger? Our living room on this planet so that's an interesting topic and i think one worth worth hearing of course it's going to be recorded and of course we'll share it with you afterwards but if you can get to the live event um all the better then on the 22nd of november this is one for your diary i have very few details this has just been confirmed we're going to be hosting a ecosystem restoration design course webinar Many of you will be already familiar. We've been running the very popular ecosystem restoration design course for a couple of years now. The next one kicks off on the 10th of February, 2024. So it's one to bear in mind. If you've been thinking of doing this course for a while, if you just keep missing the start date, that's the module one out of five modules for this year long course. There's lots of space and time in between to relax and enjoy life. It's it's um, th there's a lot of content in the course, but it's very evenly spread over a, a very manageable period of time. It really does equip you with everything you need to have to become a fully fledged earth restorer. And we're going to be sending out the notification 
of that webinar really soon. So watch your inboxes. If you're not on our mailing list, go to our website right now and subscribe to make sure you don't miss any of our news. Then, excitingly, we have six different opportunities right now for you to get involved on the ground, whether you're in Kenya or in uh, Brazil. Um, uh, we've also got one, a new one in Altiplano in Spain, which is with the EU Solidarity Corps. Um, there are six amazing opportunities to really um, get involved and, and get your hands dirty and do that work that all of us dream of doing. Um, there are short-term opportunities, longer-term opportunities, learning opportunities. Um, don't forget also the one at the end there, the last slide image is of Corcovado, actually, which is in uh, Costa Rica. So pop onto our website. Um, our website is erc.earth. I mean, how easy is that website to remember? erc.earth. So pop on there and have a look at the click on the participate page and find all the details you need of those volunteers for you. I'm going to share just a couple of um, a couple of news items for you. Uh, firstly, you can read, but I'll just tell you the highlights so that in partnership with Ratio Viva and those of you who came to our last fireside chat before the four month break will know all about Piero and Ratio Viva. Um, it's quite exciting because we managed to secure funding through the Erasmus, the EU Erasmus program to build our monitoring and evaluation uh, infrastructures. Um, and that is, that's everything. I mean, without monitoring and evaluation, we can't prove the power of ecosystem restoration. Everyone here in this room knows about the power of ecosystem restoration and is convinced of it. But we need scientific evidence to, to really, not to argue, but to prove our case. And so this is a really a big step and we're very excited about this, about this funding. Sino de Valle, which is the ecosystem restoration community located just outside Rio de Janeiro in a, on a strip of the Atlantic rainforest, the Mata de Atlantica, they have received recognition from their government for the work that they do with jackfruits. There is an amazing blog on our website that you can read all around jackfruits and how they're creating an industry there, which is creating employment and nutrition um, and all sorts of benefits. And that's well worth, worth reading, but we commend them for that, that recognition. And then a, a small win, but still a great one for Contour Lines in Guatemala. They've just received a grant of a thousand euros um, and that's similarly towards their post harvest value adding and processing project so they also are work with the, working with products that the local community are harvesting through the agroforestry products project sorry that they've been building there in all these villages um, for a couple of years now and this fund is going to help them develop that product line um, and that whole sort of value chain um, to help them and the, the communities to start to benefit from making income from selling their, their produce. Lastly, I just want to highlight, we have two um, amazing new blog posts. If you read the newsletter that went out last week, you would have seen them. Um, the one is around how wild horses uh, are helping to repair reclaimed mine lands in Kentucky, in USA, and that's a lovely story. And also you can be inspired by the story of a Basilicata local Piero Franco who returned to Matera in Italy after 13 years of studying and travel abroad. You would have met Piero at the last fireside chat, but now we've really worked with a volunteer blog to tell that story um, of how he has set up Russia Viva ecosystem restoration community in Southern Italy with a group of friends really to help restore his community and in a region which has been largely abandoned, particularly by youth and, and by farmers. Um, we have an opportunity for you to join us, uh, for you to volunteer for, for us and by us, I'm referring to um, the Ecosystem Restoration Foundation, which is the very small uh, group of people who support all the restoration communities around the world. And um, this is an opportunity really to help with our tree scheme program. So that's working with um, funders like Plant for the Planet who provide money for the ecosystem restoration communities to plant trees on site. And we just need some administrative help with that, with that initiative. It is a position that can be held anywhere in the world. We're all digital nomads here at, at the foundation and the time investment is five to eight hours a week uh, for the minimum period of three months. So if that's a commitment that 
um, you're currently shouting yes to, I can't hear you because you're all on mute, or perhaps you know of someone else who would be perfect for this role, um, we'd love to hear from you. And shortly, if not already, Melissa will be sharing the link um, to that position in the chat for you to. Lastly, but really importantly, I, I just want to bring your attention to the fact that we are raising funds with our global fundraising partner, Global Giving. And this is to help around 300 families uh, in Chakaya, which is the ecosystem restoration community in Bolivia. And the way we're doing this is by introducing agroforestry and building water reservoirs. Yeah which is really gonna help with increasing food security and help them get their agroforestry projects off the ground. And importantly, provide year long access uh, to, to this life-giving water. Each reservoir that we're planning on building, and we're hoping to, we'll raise enough money to build six of these concrete reservoirs. Each one can harvest 30,000 liters of water to help irrigate around 200 agroforestry plots and provide drinking water at schools. We also want to provide another six water infiltration lakes. And this is all taking place in the Potosi Highlands in the Bolivian Andes. So if you're in a position to help with this and donate to this project and help us really create a sustainable source of water for this community, please consider making a donation to this project. It's a small project, it's only running for three months and we're a month in, and we really need your support to reach our fundraising goals with that one. Finally, and this really is finally, I know I said finally previously, but now I mean it. <laughs> we really do need your help to grow. So please tell your friends and your friends' friends and their friends all about the Mighty Movement. And, and of course, remember to tell them to donate to our work. And remember that you can catch daily, almost daily updates, particularly on our Instagram and our LinkedIn feed. So make sure that you are following us on these channels. Okay, so that's that's it from me. And without delay, I really, really want to bring Bob in. Bob van der Bell is the restoration community leader at ecosystem restoration community Koromi River in Malindi in, um, in Kenya. Bob, I see we are losing a bit of light there now. Bob is uh, an hour ahead of Central European time now. So I think he's just going to pop a light on before he disappears completely from our from our screens. Um, and Bob, really welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. I know you've had a long day out uh, on the on the land already. Um, the rest of us who who sit behind laptops all day look forward now to, to traveling vicariously through your tales of what it's like to be actually working the land and. And to really tell us more about what's happening at at Karomi River. So, if you'd like to share your presentation and and kick off, that would be fantastic. Yeah, th thanks, Kath. I'll uh, try to uh, go here. I'll say share. How does that look? Yeah, okay. Well, uh, thanks uh, so much, Kath. And also, uh, 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 I'm happy uh, that uh, many of you have uh, joined. And it's quite a, yeah, quite a feat for me that I'm uh, able to uh, yeah, discuss a little bit uh, of uh, what I've been doing uh, here in Kenya. Uh, my English is certainly much worse than uh, our moderator, uh, since I'm from the Netherlands. So... Uh, if you don't get something, uh, yeah, put it in the chat and somebody uh, will pick it up, uh, hopefully. Uh, I'm talking to you not from uh, the Bush Bush, uh, but uh, from Malindi, a small town in uh, coastal Kenya. And uh, in fact, uh, yeah, the journey that I made, uh, yeah, you could say uh, started here in uh, Malindi when it comes to... Uh, planting trees and uh, and uh, ecosystem restoration uh, i i'm an economist myself i uh, yeah worked a lot in uh, trade and investment promotion between the netherlands and africa i went a lot with uh, yeah consortia uh, in different uh, uh, fields uh, know a lot of companies that are working in africa and uh, when i moved to kenya i was focusing on uh, consulting in agribusiness and through 
a consultancy uh, for the World Bank, which was about uh, greening of uh, value chains. Uh, I got more and more, uh, yeah, let's say, alarmed. You could say by the state of affairs of uh, of nature in uh, in uh, and uh, at the same time uh, being a grandson of farmers in the Netherlands in uh, in Iceland in the north i also had always that feeling yeah just writing reports and uh, <laughs> uh, yeah let's say uh, working with uh, intangible uh, uh, results uh, i would like to uh, do some more concrete things and uh, in that case, I'm almost uh, like the average Kenyan because I think only uh, three weeks before I turned 50 is when we actually planted uh, the first uh, tree in the uh, in Koromi River camp. And uh, yeah, you could say that it was really late, but uh, I believe uh, it's better uh, late than never when it comes to uh, really doing something. And uh, it walks to also cool. maybe disappoint you a little yeah. bit. I'm still not definitely not all the time uh, in the shamba uh, because i have uh, several uh, uh yeah land holdings uh, here in the uh, in the malindi area and uh yeah it is and let's say i i visit uh, koromi uh, on average i think once twice uh, per week i have the other uh, farm which will i which i will also discuss uh, this evening it is in uh, a bit nearby uh, Malindi. Uh, so at the same time, there's also other things uh, to do, like uh, administration and uh, uh, looking, uh, running after uh, funding. And so it is a bit, uh, I'm a bit on the move. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think uh, at a certain scale, yeah, you can also not afford to uh, yeah, do the only the manual, uh, the manual work. Maybe it would be more healthy uh, for me. But uh, anyway, let's see. I have prepared a few uh, slides. And uh, uh, this is the first one that you see in front of you. Uh, this is from the high. We have a land holding at Koromi River, which is uh, 500 uh, acres, so 200 hectares. And you see uh, below Forest Revive, you see uh, in the distance something that looks a little bit uh, different. There, there is where we have... Uh, planted uh, Malia Falkensi trees, a very uh, drought resistant uh, tree. And uh, basically, if I uh, can summarize it, uh, as I said, as I put there below, uh, biodiverse uh, reforestation and agroforestry. But when we started in uh, making our plans in 2017, 2018, we were really uh, more thinking of uh, uh, agroforestry. Uh, so that means uh, in our case, we had identified uh, this uh, drought resistant tree, but also Moringa olivera. And our idea from the starting point was uh, the trees are growing. While the trees are growing, we will harvest uh, the seeds from uh, Moringa olivera. And uh, yeah, we will make that into uh, uh, an oil for uh, cosmetics. So we really started as a commercial venture uh yeah doing activities let's say slightly close to uh, 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 the ecosystem uh, restoration but definitely was not completely the starting point and, and that is a bit i think the journey is how to discover how you have to do things and not to do things but also how to yeah i, I have also i think personally uh, evolved in this uh, this project, we started with some uh, with uh, two other shareholders. One is no longer there; uh, the other one is still there. But I will also discuss a little bit those uh, dynamics uh, with you in my uh, in my presentation. So I'll go to the next slide. Uh, I think most of you will know uh, where Kenya is, uh, but maybe not all of you know is that. Well over 80% of Kenya is uh, arid and semi-arid. And uh, basically in the, the, the blue circle, you, you could see here Malindi uh, on the right-hand side uh, down where, where it is. Uh, yeah, it's clear from the Google Maps that uh, yeah, the, the coastal zone uh, is, is uh, less dry, but the more you go inland, uh, the drier it gets. And... Uh, let's say to a large extent that is caused by 
deforestation. Uh, the the coastal zone used to be maybe a hundred years ago one big uh, forest, and now there's only one small uh, forest uh, left, and that forest is, uh, I think, about uh, 450 years per kilometer. It's called uh, Arabuco Sokoke, and uh, the smallest, uh, the small farm that I have in my nursery is located there. It's four hectares, uh, 15 kilometers from uh, Malindi, uh, let's say to the straight to the west, and then uh, Koromi River project, as I said, 200 hectares. It is about uh, yeah, let's say depending on which route you take, about 70, uh, 65 kilometers uh, inland. So in a much drier, uh, in a much drier area. So now, what is the? Yeah, currently after the let's say how things evolved, uh, basically I could say uh, yeah, our mission is ecosystem restoration through biodiverse uh, reforestation and agroforestry. And uh, basically, my idea uh, would be uh, maybe it's because I uh, yeah I was uh, uh, trained as an economist. I, I want to incentivize people to uh, invest their time and money and uh, and energy uh, yeah, on on all levels. Uh, investors, local landowners, local communities uh, in following our example but as i said we are still also developing uh, our uh, our concepts uh, more and more but at the end of the day i uh, yeah let's say if you talk about a dream uh, i would like to have a lot of uh, uh, people uh, following the example where they can yeah generate revenues uh, generate incomes uh, on the one hand but on the other hand uh, they really make a, a strong impact on uh, on the ecosystem. So uh, th th this is one picture uh, of uh, of our uh, let's say a big uh, agroforestry project. Uh, you still see it's maybe not that easy to see. There is still some moringa uh, in between the trees that we planted. Uh, uh, we are talking about an area that is. Uh, in general, I think receiving about uh, 500, 600 millimeters uh, of rain per year. But uh, when we started, the rains were really excellent. And I, I thought like, wow, this is a, this fantastic. Uh, things will go fast. Uh, but in 2020, 2021, 2022, uh, almost three years, we had very little rain. So it was actually... Yeah, it was a very challenging, uh, and uh, I could say that definitely not all things uh, went uh, the way I had hoped uh, they would go. Uh, and basically, this year we hope to uh, to catch up, basically to get uh, with the El Nino rains to get a lot, and uh, yeah, also uh, yeah, look at uh, several other things we. we the tree you see mostly here is uh, Melia Fokensi, what I already uh, mentioned. It's a termite uh, resistant and highly drought tolerant tree. Uh, we found out that basically only watering a little bit uh, in between uh, the planting rainy season and the next rainy season uh, will yeah, give you a very high uh, survival rate. Uh, we have also done an agroforestry trial there, and there we found that, uh, yeah, really for fruit uh, production, uh, uh, the rainfall is not enough, and it is, uh, yeah, they will survive, but uh, you won't get any uh, production. Uh, and there, uh, that's why I put now uh, non-timber forest products there and TFP, because we now look more towards uh, local fruits that are highly. Uh, uh, let's say, tolerant to uh, to drought and also to uh, products like uh, honey, maybe some medicinal uh, 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 products that we can uh, produce from uh, from uh, trees. And uh, one thing that I, that we come to speak of uh, is uh, yeah, how to uh, get water on your uh, land. Without water, yeah, you're basically uh, stuck. You, you will not get... Uh, high survival rates in such a dry climate. And uh, we have made some tests in our small farm uh, on rainwater harvesting, uh, which we now want to uh, uh, roll out also on this bigger uh, uh, project. Uh, 
where we can, on the one hand, uh, pump water from the seasonal river when it's flowing. And on the other hand, uh, we capture uh, the water, the run of water uh, from the hillsides. And uh, <laughs> our idea would eventually be that we could uh, uh, stock those uh, rainwater uh, basins with uh, catfish, African catfish. So that's why I call it uh, aqua forestry. And uh, uh, we hope that by next year we will... Uh, yeah, get uh, get sufficient funding to uh, to to scale our first uh, our first uh, pilot up uh, on this uh, on this location. Go to the next uh, slide. Well, achievements. Uh, it is very everybody who is planting trees uh, in dry areas knows. Even counting is not so uh, easy. Uh, I've seen last year, for instance, uh, we planted forty thousand trees. I think only 5,000 uh, survived because we really had uh, almost no water uh, resources. Uh, so that was tough. But I think, yeah, if we count from, uh, let's say, May 2019, uh, we are now about uh, at uh, 40,000 trees. And uh, with a whole team of uh, staff and uh, interns, volunteers, uh, we are now uh, basically getting ready uh, uh in the coming uh, weeks and, and maybe months uh, to plant uh, another uh, 20,000 uh, trees uh, this year, probably before uh, before the end of the year. The agroforestry pilot I mentioned already, it's uh, two hectares with many different uh, crops we have tried. Uh, basically, conclusion was that uh, it is it was uh, uh, too optimistic to grow uh, fruit trees uh, there. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's why I already explained to you we want to uh, change our uh, our focus a little bit. Uh, we, we have a, a local tree expert that has forty years of experience in the let's say the the identification and and uh, use of uh, natural uh, trees and shrubs, and uh, he did a survey in. Uh, only part of the 200 hectares and he found already over 300 indigenous uh, trees and shrubs and uh, we are seeing that because we have a permanent presence uh, there yeah that uh, yeah that really also uh, it's not only the tree planting on areas where not much is uh, growing but it's also uh, definitely uh, adding to the conservation of uh, of the area on both farms uh, i have i think around 20 uh, uh, yeah, permanent and, and uh, uh, temporary uh, people working. And uh, we did also a, a bit of training uh, on, uh, on tree planting uh, on other aspects uh, around uh, 100. But one thing I would like to discuss with you is like uh, yeah, e even joining uh, Ecosystems Restoration Camp uh, uh, communities, I should say, actually. Sorry, Melissa. Uh, uh, but joining such a movement is is really great because in general uh, it is still a little bit uh, solitary uh, and the uh, investors can get a bit grumpy uh, ah it's taking so long and uh, are you moving fast enough uh, that they, they don't have uh, let's say the the a good insight in your uh, challenges uh, the money is revenues are limited so you have very few staff uh, members and uh, I think it helps a lot uh, to be in a network with uh, people that are doing uh, similar th uh, similar things and uh, yeah I think in terms of uh, uh, yeah other partnerships that will also uh, yeah help uh, help to work uh, more effectively uh, we are working together with uh, the Kenya Forestry Research Institute uh, with Nature Kenya uh, Grow Pact, which is a horticultural uh, uh, group that 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 has uh, yeah has uh, provided me with uh, let's say free uh, uh, advice on a very regular basis. Uh, the same for Acacia Water from the Netherlands, which uh, is which are experts in, uh, in groundwater and and uh, integrated water resources management. And uh, lastly. We have, we now have a contract with a company called uh, Would You Care, and uh, 
they they are actually the first ones that are uh, paying me uh, an amount in euros uh, per, for every tree that I have uh, that I've planted. So that goes in smaller numbers, but we hope to increase that. And uh, also together with uh, uh, Christina, uh, we are also talking to a company in Italy that is interested in uh, in doing the same. So the technical aspects uh, will not go too deeply into it, but uh, uh, what I did in 2019 was to make a, it was more a focus on uh, uh and with the tree, we said we, we want to do this tree, you see on your left hand side. But now our question was at that time, which crops are we going to put uh, in between the trees? So we made a, a big study with a few students on uh, which crops are suitable and also uh, on uh, the market aspects of those uh, crops. Uh, now, in the meantime, uh, since we had had this very uh, tough period of drought, we our attention shifted more towards uh, selecting other trees and uh, and uh, shrubs to now plant in between uh, in between the trees. And I think if you look a bit close by, you can see, uh, for instance, some uh, wild kapok trees now that we planted uh, last year. Uh, some of them are already uh, well over a meter high. And our idea is now that we create much more biodiversity uh, in terms of uh, uh, trees. So uh, together with uh, a group of interns and especially one intern uh, that I actually, uh, uh, or that found me through uh, the ESC uh, website, uh, we are, uh, which is called, who's called uh, Matilde. We are now really, uh, let's say, updating our concept uh, towards much more biodiverse uh, reforestation, where we will get uh, one third of the trees with the objective to uh, to harvest uh, timber and uh, uh, two thirds plants that we can harvest something from or simply uh, that are good to uh, improve the soil or to uh, improve the ecosystem. Uh, so that that is currently the yeah, let's say the exercise that we are doing, uh, planting density. We are also tr uh, making trials. Uh, this one you see on this picture is uh, quite dense for uh, Kenyan uh, uh, standards. It's uh, two and a half by two and a half meters. In general, for natural trees, we would uh, go for uh, five by five uh, meters. Uh, pruning, also interesting. Uh, some trees require a lot of pruning others don't well this one on the picture here uh, definitely requires a lot and uh, uh, from the branches uh, we intend to uh, make biochar uh, that we use again with planting of uh, of additional uh, of additional trees which which we found out is working uh, really well and uh, also on the picture, well, it is a bit uh, small, I have to admit, but you see three seeds, for instance, also there. So obviously, if you don't prune, uh, you get uh, also three seeds that uh, yeah that you could uh, that you could harvest. This may be something just for you to take a look at. Uh, uh, this this land is actually quite interesting because there there are many seasonal rivers in Kenya and uh, we, we actually bought this land uh, because we found that uh, well after the rainy season was over there was still water in the riverbed uh, and yeah, we were really thinking that uh, yeah that would be a lot uh, and, and, and even help us with, uh, with uh, the production of, uh, of crops however all our attempts of uh, putting in small dams, uh, et cetera, et cetera, it failed completely. Uh, so we have uh, removed them again. And uh, now, uh, yeah, along the river, but not inside the riverbed, we now want to, uh, to put uh, rainwater harvesting uh, basins. Uh, so that's uh, totally different. And uh, what is interesting in terms of ecosystem uh, restoration is that... Uh, yeah, we, we will actually demarcate uh, a zone that is maybe on average, uh, yeah, let's say 80 meters uh, 
along the river on both sides uh, where we will not do anything but uh, just conserving uh, what is there so uh, and in the other uh, parts of the land yeah we'll uh, we always uh, had our uh, principle that anything over uh, five meters high we should uh, keep it uh, and on, we only remove uh, basically uh, trees and shrubs uh, yeah, after uh, yeah, let, let's say our tree expert has uh, has identified that it is okay to do, and I'll come back uh, I'll come back to that uh, later on, and also uh, lastly, when it comes to this uh, zoning, yeah, we definitely uh, yeah, we are fine also with uh, investors or uh, or companies that want to invest in uh, purely. Uh, putting natural uh, forest uh, reforestation, and uh, yeah, that is what we hope to do with uh, with the Italian company. And uh, we have already identified, uh, let's say, a, a bit more than uh, twenty hectares uh, to do that. So now uh, challenges. I think I've mentioned already a few, but I think it's it would be interesting for me to uh, share some uh, thoughts on that uh, during the Q and A. We have. Uh, yeah, the first one you heard already drought uh, you can see on the picture yeah that it is really uh, this was let's say definitely uh, after uh, having uh, uh, some rain still you see the grass but in the beginning it was really in many places there was nothing uh, much left on the soil to cover and uh, it was also difficult for me to yeah, initially to explain how I wanted it with mulching. So, so this was a bit, let's say, the the beginning, uh, the beginning steps. Uh, I think water resources. I discussed them, uh, talking about limited short-term uh, revenue streams. Yeah, that is maybe is the the biggest uh, challenge uh, for uh, anyone who uh, wants to do uh, a project uh, that includes uh, forestry. Uh, I, I can only say that uh, it even, yeah, it, it, you have to really invest uh, a lot of money if you want to do it uh, at scale. And uh, yeah, basically, I have taken the personal risk of uh, just selling my uh, apartments in the Netherlands and actually uh, do it. And uh, that that is, I think, something we can maybe uh, discuss on the basis of uh, one of the next slides where I've listed some uh, revenue streams and potential uh, revenue streams another let's say uh, point is the typical local challenges you, you might think that uh, camels are only in the desert but uh, surely not uh, in kenya there there are millions of uh, of camels uh, and basically uh, the owners uh, hire uh, uh, herdsmen to Basically, uh, yeah, yeah, work walk around with them uh, in very big uh, areas. Uh, so they, yeah, these camels can be uh, eight hundred kilometers uh, from uh, yeah their their original uh, base camp, so to speak. And uh, besides camels, we have uh, cows and uh, definitely also uh, a lot of goats. So for us, and we, yeah, for for instance. Uh, the tree planting you are really scared they will uh, trample on all the trees or uh, or eat them uh, so far the biggest damage uh, that i had was on uh, on the uh, mango trees which i had uh, tried but generally speaking yeah it is it is not uh, it is not, has not been disastrous but on the other hand it is uh, yeah, also you always have that feeling uh yeah, it's it's very tricky if you plant on high densities and uh and 50 uh, camels pass by and the trees are still small that definitely you'll have uh, damage uh the other thing that is happening is uh, a lot in this area where we are working is uh charcoal production so the the most valuable hardwood trees are uh are uh, cut down and uh, and uh, the local communities yeah I, I think it's one of their main sources of income is to uh, produce charcoal but it's really uh, 
yeah, it's it's very painful if you see that uh, the most expensive hardwood trees are uh, are uh, used to uh, make charcoal of, uh, which they sell then for uh, yeah very low amount, maybe uh, two euro uh, for a big uh, bag. Uh, yeah, and it, and and I would say it is definitely a challenge. Yeah, what can you offer the local communities? Uh, 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 to, to 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 generate revenues uh, apart from uh, producing charcoal or uh, cutting down trees for uh, for poles etc cetera, etc cetera. so that that's also for me interesting to discuss uh, with all of you and lastly what is a challenge is that uh, yeah for instance what I said about mulching or about uh, yeah how to plant uh, you ha really have to invest in your team not all people are equally uh, motivated but uh, i can say after uh, yeah now uh, more than 4 years uh, really working at the project uh, i now have a very good very uh, reliable uh, staff and uh, and also good uh, expertise however for the scaling up of this uh, uh, this work to the local communities it's actually quite uh, I think it's quite uh, difficult and, and we hope to learn a lot from uh, organizations such as uh, Nature Kenya on uh, on how to do that because yeah the people have a low income uh, they, they are in general I think not aware that uh, yeah let's say uh, deforestation is uh, also causing yeah the, uh, the exacerbation of of already existing climate change effects so that's uh, yeah, how to convince them of that, and and secondly, yeah, the people uh, who are walking with the cattle, yeah, basically they, uh, yeah, they have they are not from that area. Uh, they they have uh, zero uh, compassion with uh, with nature in general. So that that is for me really a, a tough uh, nut uh, to crack. So community uh, management, uh, community engagement. Uh, and we have asked around uh, the local communities what do they really uh, prefer the most and uh, yeah, a bit to our surprise all of them almost uh, uh, preferred uh, moringa because they can eat uh, the moringa leaves in the dry uh, season but uh, so so that was interesting for uh, for the local communities but the actual tree planting yeah, was much less uh, uh, interesting for uh, for people. Uh, so that still requires a lot of uh, awareness raising. Obviously, besides our direct employment, we also have a lot of indirect uh, employment, uh, like uh, carpenters, uh, uh, motorcycle drivers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Go to the next one. Dilemmas. I think you've heard already a few of them, but maybe not all. Uh, so I'll list them and maybe good for a discussion. Uh, this tree that that uh, that we have started planting the most uh, is is indigenous to Kenya, but not specifically to the the coastal uh, zone. Uh, some people say yes, only plants what was originally uh, there uh, whereas of course the yeah, your commercial uh, angle would sometimes make it attractive to uh, be a bit less uh, uh, orthodox on that but i'd like to hear your views on that uh, definitely uh, uh, since I, I i got more and more a bad feeling myself uh, when i saw now yeah, let's say almost a pure stand of one uh, tree uh, that I yeah, already took the initiative to now put in many more different uh, uh, varieties. Uh, still, we see in commercial forestry, of course, uh, much more uh, of a monoculture. So uh, um, we have decided we go to the biodiversity way. And uh, yeah, I'm also very interested to hear uh, your perspective on uh, yeah, how to do that interplanting. Uh, the, the only thing I can say that is maybe interesting to note is that uh, whenever we had to cut down a tree, because for instance, it, it was uh, 
growing totally bent or it fell over. Uh, I think in 99% of the cases, uh, there was a regrowth. So, so the, so, so that makes me quite confident that, uh, it is actually okay to harvest, uh, some of the trees for timber because we know almost hundred percent sure that it will, uh, will grow back. Then even maybe a bigger dilemma, uh, bush, and uh, what bush clearing. To clear everything is, of course, a uh, no-go. Uh, so I already said we want to leave the bigger trees there. But we are still now a bit considering uh, if we leave more and more intact, yeah, then the, let's say, the management aspect becomes a bit more difficult. You can no longer plant uh, rows. Uh, which tree is where can be a bit uh, more difficult. So what we want to try out... Uh, this season is, uh, let's say, to, to clear a lot less and uh, yeah, plant a lot less uh, straight. But uh, I'd also like to hear your uh, your perspective uh, on that later on. And then, uh, yeah, last but not least, uh, Nature Kenya, which is the, the biggest nature conservancy uh, conservation organization, they are buying land. Other organizations are buying land. Uh, many. Uh, it seems to be, yeah, let's say the easy solution to uh, for nature conservation is to uh, to buy land and try to uh, yeah to prevent uh, deforestation, uh, poaching, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the longer term, probably better model is uh, to work with outgrowers, but uh, then you really have to find a solution on. Uh, on the incentives uh, you want to work for uh, uh, use them. So for now, I'm, I'm doing a bit of both. Uh, we will, the moment we have more water resources, we'll buy uh, the adjacent land. Uh, most land in this region is not owned by the local population, but has been sold already to others. So it's quite easy to expand. Uh, on the other hand, I also don't think it is a... Uh, yeah, a good thing to uh, yeah to have these uh, these uh, UFO type of uh, uh, projects where you where you land from uh, outside and uh, yeah you, you don't take uh, the local communities uh, along with your uh, your way of thinking or with your uh, yeah the concepts you are uh, developing. Next slide. To, to close off, because I think I've already uh, finished my time, a few pictures of the other uh, farm, uh, the one closer to uh, Malindi. Uh, so I've put a training center, uh, research, hospitality. And uh, the last but not least, there is, of course, our uh, tree nursery. When we had no uh, rain, we had to do... Uh, yeah, uh, something. So I had already bought uh, this land uh, where we had planted uh, fruit trees mainly. And uh, so basically we moved our natural tree uh, nursery also here. And as you can see on the picture, uh, I think this building, we built it uh, last year. And uh, we only did, had have done a few trainings there. Uh, for now, uh, we have just basically uh, started uh, the promotion of uh, of it as a like a farm to fork a restaurant an event uh, location but it's not only fruit trees uh, also here we have planted uh, natural trees we are uh, selling natural tree uh, seedlings so uh, yeah there is still let's say this is a, a very light agroforestry uh, type and I already said in the in the WhatsApp group that uh, here we now we really experiment. We want to, we have experimented here with uh, yeah. fish farming. We have the ponds. So everything we want to do in larger scale, we uh, first test uh, on this, uh, on this smaller farm. Here you see the, some of the seedlings. Uh, so sometimes we can get seedlings somewhere. Sometimes we promote them ourselves. Sometimes we buy them, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, we do part of it in the shade uh, and part of it we do uh, just under trees. I also put their arboretum just for awareness raising. Uh, uh, we are next to the forest. Uh, 
but let's say there are elephants in the forest you cannot just uh, walk there uh, so important local trees uh, together with our uh, tree expert uh, Masha Uri we want to uh, make arboretum there maybe a, a one hectare or something like that that uh, also people from the town uh, can easily come and uh, learn more about uh, about trees th th this is what it looks like the same building uh, in the background uh, and you can see many different uh, crops we have uh, I think to the right is where we test uh, jackfruit. We have uh, different types of mangoes, bananas, plantains, passion, guava, etc. So for all of them, we want to find out uh, yeah, how drought resistant uh, are they, uh, uh, how difficult or easy to manage uh, uh, they are. And uh, yeah, basically, uh, I, I would say this is one of the first, uh, yeah, let's say a bit... Uh, yeah, let's say modern plant uh, uh, food farms uh, here at the coast. This is of one of the trainings. So you can see that people have a beautiful uh, view and uh, see also in the background uh, one of the uh, rainwater harvesting basins uh, there. And uh, yeah, basically, uh, we hope that with partnerships with uh, which I just mentioned that uh, that we can also do more uh, workshops here or meetings or uh, farmer markets, uh, things like that. Now, ecosystem uh, restoration communities uh, has really, uh, I would say, in a friendly way, forced me to upgrade uh, the facilities. So this is, again, a Koromi farm. We have... Uh, I think before joining, uh, we have expanded the yeah, the outdoor space. Uh, we have put very simple uh, showers and uh, and toilets, and and we are still upgrading uh, the place thanks to the the interns that are helping me uh, today. I hope they can uh, listen, but the internet is not always uh, that great. But they are now helping me a lot, and uh, yeah, we hope that uh, yeah this can be a place where. Almost all the time, uh, we have some uh, some volunteers. You see, you, uh, I don't know if potential volunteers are uh, listening, but uh, you can see it's a nice place, and uh, you have a nice uh, sunset uh, this evening. And of course, our uh, motorcycle that uh, that we use for transport uh, to and fro uh, uh, the village. And these are uh, the current interns. One of them is not yet, not on the picture, but. Uh, I have no no less than five, and uh, actually Matilda on the left is, uh, yeah, maybe uh, I hope she is uh, in the call uh, because then maybe uh, later on she can uh, she can say something uh, say something uh, also to you about her uh, experience. I think that's uh, that's all from uh, my end. Uh, one slide I somehow have left out, or maybe a technical uh, issue. Uh, but I think I'll go back. Uh, stop. Uh, I'll stop the the, sc the screen sharing now. Uh, basically, on the revenues, I, th I think that uh, we are currently, uh, besides timber, we are looking at uh, honey. Uh, we are looking at yeah, let's say eco tourism. We get. Uh, we hope to get more companies that will pay us for uh, planting trees. But we are also, let's say we are a small project. Uh, carbon credit uh, community is always asking for, uh, yeah, let's say 1,000 hectares, 2,000 hectares, huge numbers. Uh, and I think that the, the incentives are not always the best ones. Uh, Many companies like that, uh, they are planting uh, eucalyptus, and which uh, I think is not, in general, not very uh, beneficial. And uh, so we are also very curious yeah, what, what we should do uh, to work more towards uh, biodiversity uh, credits. And uh, yeah, I think uh, I didn't look at the time, but uh, Cass, I hope it was not extremely long, but uh, I think this was uh, this was about it. Thank you, Bob, so much. We have run a little bit over time, but I actually just didn't want to interrupt you because I was just enjoying listening so much to everything you were 
you were sharing with us. And I think what you have really successfully done as well is you've highlighted the, the truly multifaceted approach that it actually takes to successfully run an ecosystem restoration project in a way that it really does benefit all stakeholders and importantly that it remains sustainable because you know as you turned uh, explained earlier there's a very slow return initially um, for investors there's a slow return on trees that you plant nature takes its time it gets early but you know there's there's no sort of quick fix and and one needs to have this holistic approach and to to consider this before setting out and think about how am I going to you know keep myself sustained during the process. And I think you've you've um, your business acumen clearly comes through because you've thought about this from from all angles. But I think what you've proven amongst uh, overall is that one has to be adaptable. You just constantly have to just meet the challenges as they arise and adapt to you know to take them head on. Um, there are quite a lot of questions that have come through, understandably, on the chat. I was really hoping, and you also had your questions that you posed that I was hoping we could discuss. I know that it's already just almost going on 10 past the hour and that some people may need to leave, but I was hoping that we could hear, if the connectivity is good, just for two minutes, maybe from Matilda or one of the volunteers that is um, constantly with you, because, uh, you may not all be aware, but we have two amazing volunteer opportunities available right now at Karomi River, at Arabuka Farm and at the main Karomi Farm. Um, Matilda read about these and she, she's travelled there to work now with with um, with Bob. So I'm hoping that, um, I, I thought it would be fun if we could hear sort of a first-hand account on, on what it's actually like to be immersed there and to um, experience um being a volunteer so Matilda I don't know if you are um if you are there could you maybe um unmute yourself and just say hi so then I can find you and and bring you into the um bring you into the chat I'm just looking for you we've I'm I'm going through um or just start speaking and then I can um I'll bring in your video too, if you are still with us. Um, maybe Melissa can also just let me know if Matilda is um, is online or if that that bad connection is um, is winning. All right, I think um, in the interest of of moving on, I'm going to suggest that we start answering some of these questions. Um, and then Matilda, if you are there, I'll bring you in afterwards. So Bob, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna spotlight you again. Um, I'm also going to uh, suggest that we maybe don't take more questions in the, in the chat, um, but if you have got a question after we've worked through these ones that came through during the presentation, um, you can maybe be brave and stick your hand up um and and answer them so right uh where do i begin um there's a message from um uh, from isatu who says thank you so much for the presentation their project reforest the future gambia have got similar models and we wants to know he, sorry he'd like to know how can you connect so that you can um you can share ideas and learn from each other so maybe but what you want to do is just pop your email address if you happen to do that um, in the chat um, and mm -hmm. Isatu can pick it up that way. Otherwise, Isatu just bang an email off to hello at erc.earth. I'll pick it up and I will connect you with, with Bob. But we love um, collaboration on that level. So that's that's brilliant. Um, another question or another statement from, from John. Um, Jonathan's at, at Hotlam, of course, in Northern California. Um, and he says good luck and he believes it would be beneficial for actually ecosystem restoration communities to form a working group to discuss and focus on the economic and investment opportunities regarding ecological function. Um, and I completely agree. And I'm sure that if Ash is is listening, I'm sure yeah, I know she's listening and that would be of interest to her to maybe look at setting up a group or having even a separate webinar where we can all bring our ideas to the table and and discuss that our our zendesk knowledge platform would be another great uh platform for that so I've, I've made a note of that and thank you um jonathan will take that forward 
Then Kent Wagoner would like to know, are you preparing compost with a focus on microbial content? But that's for you. Yeah, it's a, it's a good one. We have, uh, in let's say in 2019, uh, uh, we, we have used a lot of uh, dried uh, manure. Uh, on the small farm, uh, we are using and producing compost. Uh, challenge in the larger uh, forestry or agroforestry project at Koromi was that we had very little uh, because of the drought uh, undoubtedly and also because of the unplanned grazing we had very little uh, organic matter to uh, collect so so that that is a bit what uh, held us back in uh, producing compost uh, at the same time uh, I think adding uh, a little bit of biochar and a little bit of dried uh, manure, preferably from uh, goats and, uh, and cows, uh, ruminants, uh, it already helps uh, a lot. Uh, we also tried a very expensive uh, mycorrhiza gel. Uh, basically, we found that if it's really very dry, uh, even the mycorrhiza is uh, not surviving that. So we didn't see... Uh, any effect uh, of that uh, mulching, however, yeah, we are trying to do it uh, as much as possible uh, always when we uh, plant. And also, one other thing in the same uh, chapter is a uh, weeding. Uh, many people here in uh, Kenya have the habit of uh, yeah, where they say uh, weeding, spot weeding. The tree is a uh, equals uh, making a big circle around the tree uh, where there's nothing uh, growing. So it, it has been quite a, some, uh, uh, yeah, let's say, work for me to convince people that really grass is not uh, going to prevent a tree from uh, growing. So uh, now you see slowly by slowly uh, a better uh, a better cover of the, of the soil. Okay, thanks for that, Kent. I hope that, that answered your question. Another one here from Brian Hamel saying he thinks that doing contour beaver mimicry, brush berms, with some of the cut branches would really help you. Um, slow spread sink soak and also help to store more of your rainwater runoff into the land to help provide deeper infiltration, which will help your trees survive the dry months. Planting the trees on perfect contour or on key line instead of perfectly straight rows will also help with the water concerns. So I'm not sure, Bob, if those are some of the things you've already addressed or you can take notes. No, it, uh, it is a very valid uh, point. We, we have, let's say, dug some trenches uh, and let's say to a large extent, the land is quite flat, but uh, yeah, we have, we have seen when it really starts raining, uh, yeah, it, 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 we have to plug the gullies, as they say, uh, but also definitely there. Uh, uh, you know, at, if you have, are talking about uh, more than one square kilometer, it's also uh, 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 on a very small scale, it's possible. On a bigger scale, I would say, uh, uh, and that is also what we want to look into, is maybe some more mechanized uh, solutions uh, uh, would be would be interesting. Uh, where you really make small, uh, lo yeah, long, uh, little dikes, maybe a, a, a half a meter high, to really everywhere uh, to to keep the water more uh, in place. But but definitely, it also depends on the, the topography. Sometimes when it's flat, you see that almost everything infiltrates. It's, it's mainly now on the steeper uh, on the steeper ends. Uh, but uh, definitely, we can. Uh, make further improvements uh, on that. Okay, so thank you for that, Brian. Um, here's another comment uh, from Jürgen Adams saying, any chance to work with the pastoralists and their animals to, um, to, to grant land access for holistic grazing management? It could boost biodiversity and would teach a different kind of animal management being not a problem, but being part of the solution. Yeah. Uh... I think it's a very good point, and it's it is uh, let's say uh, if we would have areas where trees were four years or older, uh, all of them, then then it would have been uh, would be no problem to have, for instance, cows uh, graze in there. And uh, it's only now that we are 
yeah, let's say adding more smaller trees that it is uh, it's still a bit uh, a bit tricky uh, also what you would not expect maybe the people walking around with the cattle they are from nowhere near and so the local communities are fairly irritated uh, by them uh, basically they yeah they are outsiders and uh, uh, let's say it, it, in the long run, I think if m more people were actually uh, uh, also doing something with the land, we, we are the only ones probably there who ever planted something in the whole, uh, maybe in 20 kilometers uh, circle. Uh, the rest is just leaving it uh, like that and wait for the, the, the price of the land to, uh, to increase. Uh, but if there were more people following our example, yeah, then definitely... Uh, yeah, we would have uh, better uh, bargaining power to uh, to speak to those uh, uh, pastoralist uh, communities. But it is that, that it's a tricky topic across Africa. I think this this conflict between people that want to grow something and uh, people that uh, that are pastoralists, and uh, to make matters even more complicated, most of the cattle is owned by politicians uh, on the background or uh, other big wigs. Uh, so it is a uh, uh, it, it is a. Uh, it is not easy. If they were from the local communities, it would have been been much uh, much easier. Okay. Yeah. No. You certainly highlight a challenge that's that's been there for time immemorial with the hunter gatherers versus the pastoralists. Mm -hmm. Um, I think also the um, the development now of your uh, education center or, or training center is really going to help as you get more farmers interested in what you're doing. And, um, you know, that's how you're going to scale out by showing the benefits of what you're doing and getting more people to come on board with, with the concept. Mm -hmm. um, there, apparently, there have been a lot of good suggestions coming through from Chris Nash, who, of course, is the Ecosystem Restoration Community Leader at Pachamama here in South Africa. So I think we are going to connect you directly, Chris and Bob. I'm going to connect you tomorrow by email and you can knock, knock yourselves out with sharing sharing some ideas. That's there, great. That's... Yeah, no, I think um, you probably have a, a, some similar challenges and, and opportunities. And um, is it to another question where well, he just wanted to know about accepting international volunteers? And absolutely, I know that Bob does accept international volunteers. So by all means, pop onto erc.earth and have a look at that opportunity and um, apply. Um, I know that Colin Richards is working in Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda, and he was in Melinda in July, but was trying to reach out to you and contact and contact you, but was not able to. I think um, Bob, you may have been aware at the time, but if you can, um, I, I think uh, Colin actually, if you can just scroll up, Bob has popped his email address in the um, the chat, or else just pop an email to hello to erc.earth, and I'll connect you to Bob so that you can you can speak further. Um, there was also a question around um, to what extent have you found traditional farming or agricultural practices in this part uh, of Kenya has directed your experiments? So is there something that you've learned from existing traditional practices in the area that has guided your, um, your own plan for the land? Um... Uh, not to be honest, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, but it, there is, there is different uh, ways of looking at it. For instance, if you look at near at the coastal strip, you see that uh, most uh, mangoes that are now producing are already quite old and uh, and huge. And I was more looking at it at that time uh, when it comes to fruit on producing something that is uh, very marketable, which is difficult with uh, when you have those huge uh, trees. So I was more looking at, uh, when it comes to fruit, more to uh, South Africa and especially also uh, Australia for, uh, let's say, the more, uh, yeah, the latest uh, insights. Uh, when I look at uh, basically the, on the whole, the agricultural practices in, uh, in Kenya is a, uh, yeah, let's say the the opposite of what would be good for the ecosystem. And there's a lot of uh, the main staple crop is maize, which is taking quite a lot of water. Many people also plant it and it uh, fails. 
whereas the pre-colonial staple crops uh, like uh, for instance uh, uh, millet uh, yeah, is, is, is much more uh, water efficient and even much more uh, healthy uh, and you see also a lot of people from uh, let's say central Kenya buying land here they put uh, pineapple which is also a crop that requires a lot of sun so so erases any, any, everything that uh, grows so it's, it's more I think the challenge is more to uh, to change the agri the agricultural practices and uh, contrary to for instance West Africa and the Sahel where they, farmers are actually planting a lot of trees and making these uh, yeah, let's say small uh, circles around what they plant it's it's not uh, I would say it's not that great and uh, and I think uh, uh, yeah maybe it's also because of uh, yeah, let's say a limited, uh, yeah, let's say agricultural uh, tradition. Uh, uh, I, I would say probably a hundred years ago, fifty years ago, it was more pastoralism in the dry areas than uh, than agriculture. So that's maybe one of the one okay. of the reasons. Thanks, Bob. Um, I I'm very aware that there are two people who've had their hands raised for a while, and um, I'm going to get to you now, Susan Krings or Krings, and to you, John. And there was someone, just the last question that, that um, one of the last questions that came through on the chat was just around, they want to know your final opinion on traditional, or sorry, on native versus non-native species. But I think we've kind of unpacked that a bit and we have spoken about it, about the value of natural versus bringing in other species that are maybe exotic, but for other purposes. So I think we'll hold that now, but I really just want to get to Susan, who's been incredibly patient. Thank you, Susan. Um, so that Yay. you can... Uh, Thank you, and um, ask your question. Yeah, well, I don't really have a question. I just had some um, some comments on what Bob was uh, talking about and, and what his needs are. And it just sounds like he has a lot of pressure, like um, not just from the pastoralists, but from the people who have such great need there for firewood and uh, things like that. So um, it, I'm a permaculture designer, and so we always start like close in and we take care of the people and the animals. So I think, um, you know, as far as all the resources that you're having to dump onto your land, um, if you could like start maybe smaller, closer in, so that you have a lot more success. And then as you gather more resources, including water and organic matter, then you can continue to expand outward with that. So, um, you know, just your time and energy and money will go a lot further. So um, maybe start with things, look at things that are already growing and use pioneers. Don't be, don't be so selective about um, choosing only natives or only things that are productive. Look at what's actually growing there so you can get the biodiversity more established and get it to take hold and create um, microclimates and situations, nursing areas where you can grow things that are more valuable to people. Choose trees that might be um, really great for coppicing so that the people who are foraging for firewood, you can actually be growing their firewood for them and teach them rocket mass or rocket stoves so that they need smaller sticks and smaller organic matter to burn and they're not going to be chopping down your trees. Um, I mean, I could go on and on, but I've left I've left my um, email. If you need to get in touch with me, I'd be happy to talk more um, about that. But I just really encourage you to stay smaller, stay closer in so that you can manage what's going on instead of trying to go out, you know, very far, very fast. And, um, you know, you're going to have to be like having your eyes on it and walking it all the time and having your volunteers and your interns out there actually taking care of it. So you got to you got to just bring it in. That's my advice. But I find it's very interesting points. And for sure, there's also a lot of truth in this, but I think. Um, maybe most of the camps are, in ERC are uh, more like uh, NGOs or foundations or uh, things like that. And uh, let's say even uh, yeah, to make a reasonable income out of what you are doing. Uh, let's say uh, let's say not uh, the average Kenyan income, but uh, half of an average uh, Dutch income, so to speak. You really need scale uh, unless you are going to 
I could organize a lot of workshops or things like that. Uh, yeah, so the, the, it is a bit of a, I, I, I hear what you're saying. That's why I have the other farm to, to develop things small scale to be able to know what can I do uh, large scale. Uh, and so partly it's there, the small scale. Uh, and on the other hand, with the exotic and the non-exotic, yeah, I, some people tell me, uh, no, 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 only indigenous, uh, you're going to ruin some things. But for, for instance, some of them, I agree. For instance, in, in here in the coast, neem trees is like a weed. And it's full of neem anywhere. It's just uh, re replacing uh, the, the whole the stock of trees in, uh, in town uh, gradually. And, and Lucina is good for coppicing. Uh, but uh, let's say in contrast to maybe what you were thinking, that the locals go into the forest for their own firewood, it's basically not like that. It's there. They generate money by uh, producing charcoal, which is then going into the charcoal value chain all the way up to uh, the capital uh, city. So it's not their own needs. It's, it's their business. So th their yeah. business model is basically the opposite of... Uh, what you would like to see since since it leads to uh, deforestation uh, and with the goats it's the same thing their goats they say they they eat for free but of course the yeah the victim if you want is the is the ecosystem but it's not yeah. that they depend on that goat for eating uh, directly it is more their business is to fatten goats and then uh, sell them at a higher uh, price so it's more that we have, let's say, conflicting business models. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think after five or six years, we have, uh, we have, there are so many trees that could be suitable. So maybe we have only planted in larger numbers, 20, but uh, they're, they're, we are now making a huge long list and definitely uh, follow your advice on try a few of the of them first, see how they feel and then, uh, and then uh, get to, uh, to bigger numbers. Well, good luck with everything, Bob. Just reach out anytime. Yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. And thanks for that, Susan. And I, I particularly am interested in your, your suggestion around rocket stoves. I was introduced to those some years ago, and they're brilliant. Maybe not helping with the the, the biochar industry or the charcoal industry that, that Bob referred to, that is a co conflicting industry in the area, but certainly um, to reduce the amount of firewood needed for personal yeah, helping. John, you have your hand raised. Yes, um, I just wanted to tell you that I put two two links into the chat with um, with with videos from Valer Clark, who's been working in the Sonoran Desert and has done really tremendous work at creating infiltration and retention and returning perennial stream flows to dryland areas, extremely, extremely arid areas, both in Arizona and New Mexico and, and Me Mexico. And then also there was another great example, really wonderful example of someone who has been working for, since the 1960s in Mombasa and named Renee Holler. And if you go to the Holler Park in the Bamburi Cement uh, Company's um, area in, in Mombasa, you can see the Holler Park. And it has, it has really transformed the area that was mined for calcium carbonates for, for cement uh, um, industry and basically destroyed the landscapes with zero soils. And he's transformed that. And he's shown that it's possible to bring back water. Water becomes one of his most uh, interesting development. Um, so there's, there's a full range of activities that he he's been, has, has been le leading since 1960s. He's won numerous prizes. And uh, there is a film that I made called Forests of Hope which you might take a look at, which is mainly about Rwanda, but the Rwandans actually went to 
Kenya to Mombasa to meet Renee Haller and and see what he had accomplished. So those are those are things that I just wanted to mention. Thank you. And uh, I've, I've, I've seen another... I've seen it already, uh, John. So 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 that's uh, that's good. The the documentary. Well, thanks, John. Um, I am just think looking at the questions there. Uh, somebody asked a question about, is there a central database? I think this is aimed maybe rather at ERC than, than to, um, to Bob, but is there a central database for the different sites uh, where one can share or draw information from for reference? Um, we can tell you that there is Restore or Restore, but without the E on the end. So it's R-E-S-T-O-R dot eco. Um, that is one, um, and uh, certainly it's one that we encourage all the ecosystem restoration communities to upload their data onto. Um, I believe that there may be another exciting project afoot with something similar that's been developed within ecosystem restoration communities. So my short answer is watch the space, but in the meantime, go on to restore.eco and check, um, check that out. Um, right. Um, I'm just looking to see if there is there anyone else who has their hand raised. Um, yeah. is that to is that to thank you? Yeah. yeah, great. Um, is it to I'm going to go to you now. Give me a second to navigate. Hello, hello, everyone. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Is it yeah. You, I, I just have a contribution to congratulate everyone who is part of this platform today. And for me, it's just like today is a new day for me. And I definitely value the day because I have been starting this project for a while. And, you know, being so lonely in the Gambia because, you know, some people, they don't value what I'm doing. But today, learning a lot from you will give me a lot of encouragement. Uh, based on the questions that I, that I sent, I think from here we can work together and collaborate. And if we do that together, we will definitely make a big change, learning from each other, uh, especially my neighbor, uh, John, we are so close. Uh, Bob, we are so close from Kenya. So we can do a lot together. So I want to let you know that I am so proud about this network. And, you know, it's a university for me and it give, it, it builds my confidence and it gives me like, you know, way to move as a woman in, in development, particularly working in the forest and trying to educate people. So I definitely, you know, learn a lot and I value the day. Congratulations to all of you. Ah, thank you, uh, Isa too. And uh, great to link up more between the, the different uh, projects uh, for sure. And what I want to add a little bit uh, is that where you are working in terms of climate ma makes obviously uh, yeah all the the difference to what you can do. And uh, before I started here, I went, for instance, to Namibia, which is also fairly uh, dry, even drier than Kenya. Uh, I went to Israel to uh, look at what they are doing there in terms of uh, potential trees. And uh, there are even, I would say, uh, a lot of similarities even though the countries are in a totally different part of the world. Uh, if you're in a fairly dry area, uh, you will see similarities in, in terms of challenges. So yeah, the John named the, 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 the example of Mombasa. Mombasa has well over a thousand millimeters of uh, rain. Uh, and so you can do... Yeah, you are you can do more but if we but i would be very interested in those of you who are in let's say fairly dry areas uh we, we are now looking at for instance uh ximenia americana good for uh, cosmetics oil now maybe there are people in uh, australia doing jojoba or something like that so even when it is about uh, generating revenues from uh, yeah, drought resistant uh, uh, crops, it would be uh, very interesting to share notes because basically those products uh, can be grown in uh, in various parts uh, of the world. And, and many practices will also be the same, how to establish trees uh, successfully, etc. So it will be great to, um, yeah, let's say, have a, we can have a working group on the economics of things, but also 
technically speaking, also on the on the more drier uh, areas or maybe uh, yeah, very cold areas, uh, depending on uh, where the camps are or where the projects are. Thank you. Thank you so much, is it you for sharing um for sharing that with us? It's um it really does yeah highlight the 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 connectedness of our movement. Um we're global, but we're very we're very much connected. We're like one giant living laboratory, experimenting on the land, figuring things out, making mistakes. We're 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 very aware of that that we only learn by making mistakes, figuring things out. Often we find solutions that work in one part of the world and that um, even across by sometimes um, solutions shared solutions can be um, can be figured out um, well sorry solutions can be shared that that can address a common problem um, and and yeah just off the top of my head so I can think of at least two other restoration communities where they are um, um, harvesting for oil growing for oil production for for the cosmetic and for other industries so um, medicinal as well so certainly we can make those connections um, and set up the group that you that you've uh, suggested. Are there any other hands um, raised at the moment? Um, um, if if I can't see you and if you have a question, maybe just start talking. Um, Peter van der I see you here. Is there anything you'd like to share? Um, okay. There's a comment now that Ash is saying. Ashley Brown, of course, is our education coordinator, saying that she can connect you with Max. Max, of course, is from Sekhem, uh, which is um, near Cairo in Egypt, and they're growing jojoba. Um, so they are, yeah, there are lots of, um, there's, there's lots of uh, opportunity there for um, sharing of interest and, and knowledge. Um, John, any final thoughts that you did? I'm very aware of the time now. We've gone horribly over time this evening, afternoon, morning, wherever in the world you are, but I'm Really glad that everyone took the time to join us and to stay on. Chris Nash, I see you've got a question. Fire away, Chris. Yes, um, just more general for the ERC. Um, who would be the best person to contact to gain access to some ERC marketing material to share through personal networks or to help raise awareness? Um, and solidarity for our movement. Me. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Um, I've got a, a, we've got a great team. We're a tiny team. It's Alejandra, Melissa and I that handle um, all the, the comms and, and marketing and digital marketing. Um, but you've got my email address. So by all means, yeah. Great. Um, I'm very, I'd be very happy to provide those, to provide this to you. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And um, John, any closing words of wisdom you want to share with us before before we wrap up? Well, um, um, I, I just think that uh, it's it's crucial that more and more people become aware that everyone needs to, to collaborate on ecological restoration and that there is another possibility for um, economic thinking. We've been thinking that the only way to increase the economy is to produce things for, to be bought and sold. And I really don't think that that's true. So the, the fact is that ecological function is more valuable than things, especially when the things that we buy and sell degrade the ecosystems that we depend on for life. So essentially it's that we've inverted the economy. We've, we've raised and, and inflated the derivatives and we've devalued the source. So we need to revalue the source. And then it, it's a little bit like that story of the, um, goose that laid the golden egg. So if you if you have a goose that lays the golden egg, you want to protect that goose. And if you kill the goose, that's the end of of the golden egg. So that is kind of what humanity has been doing. And all of the dryland areas, I mean I, I've studied 
this in all continents now. And basically, many of the most desertified places were actually the most fertile places where agriculture began. And I think the mistake that people made was imagining that we're, we're more capable than nature. You know, and you could look at it from a religious point of view and say, well, we know better than God, <laughs> you know, that, that um, we, we can handle this. We can just cut down what we want. We can do what we want. And this is just fundamentally wrong. And when you, when you start from the premise of something which is fundamentally wrong, then there's a very high probability that there are going to be very serious feedback loops that that increase from this and when we understand this then we need to change and that's what i think is most important about the things that i've seen in china's list plateau and in elsewhere elsewhere in the world including in africa that if you value the ecological function and you work to increase it, you have things which you don't really expect start, starting to happen. For instance, it was possible in China to increase the, the productivity of the land by reducing the area in cultivation. Now, that's completely opposite of the idea that you need to expand the, the, the agricultural areas. You have to reduce the agricultural areas in order to have natural ecological function in, in the majority of the landscapes. And then in the area that you're working on to be productive is more productive because productivity follows function. And so if you put productivity ahead of function, you're going to kill the goose. So let's not do that. And then I think the other thing that we have to, to see is that we're in a very, very, very difficult moment in human history. And it's not a small problem. And so we're going to have to have tremendous amounts of courage and wisdom to get out of the situation that we're in because millions and potentially billions of people are disenfranchised because of the social and political systems which have grown up. And so for many of those people, they're unable to survive and their landscapes in some cases are collapsing and also they're threatened and they have been threatened and they have experienced this over centuries and millennia and if we don't if we don't understand these historical issues and have some kind of resolution to them then we're going to pay the consequences. You know, we're, we're seeing that really very clearly right now. And if we do come together and say, let's work together, then we're in a position to stop the cycle of revenge and violence. Mm -hmm. But if we don't have an alternative to this, this, cycle of violence and revenge, then it's going to continue. So, but that, in order for that to stop, one generation has to say, all right, enough is enough. What happened in the past happened, and we understand it, and we can never forget it, but we're going to have to learn forgiveness, and we're going to have to learn collaboration. And we can't do that again. You can't continue that behavior, but you, you, you have to change. And so where do we change? 
And I think that's what ecological restoration is. It's the ability to have an alternative that leads to the outcome that we want to have. And if we don't have an, uh, an alternative to what's going on now, then we continue to do what's going on. And those people who are thinking that, well, I'm in charge, let's take, you know, we'll, we'll do what we're gonna do and that's it. And that's the way it's always happened and that's the way it's gonna continue. That's a very dangerous path. And if we're going to change, I mean, it's not like this is new. I mean, I, I think Buddha or Jesus or Martin Luther King or Gandhi or Nelson Mandela, they're all saying the, the, the same thing to us. We better take, take a look at those people and say, why are they saying that? You know, what is it about them that we need to listen to? Because if we don't change, then I don't think we can afford it, if you, if you know what I mean. The consequences to this are quite serious. All of the cradles of civilization were desertified. That should give us some pause. And if we look at the facts, it's not necessary to desertify these areas. The, the principles which maintain the hydrology, the soil fertility, and the biodiversity are the same now as they always have been. It's human consciousness and understanding about this which changes it. And it is hard. It's not at all easy to, to do restoration because you have to learn to change behavior. You have to, you have, to have collective intelligence. Mm -hmm. And so if we can work for collaborative inquiry, for collective intelligence, and we can build the social infrastructure necessary to make sure that all people are fed and all people have meaningful work and all people are, are taken care of, instead of just saying, well, I, my only responsibility is to take care of myself, then we get a different result. And that result is the one we need because in fact, we're only here for a few decades. And then we pass away. And so whatever we, we leave to the next generation, is going to determine the quality of life for them. And if we, we leave the situation as it is now, then it's, it's not going to be very good for our children and our grandchildren. So we have a responsibility. We know kind of what we need to do. It's not like we know everything, but we know enough to know that biodiversity, biomass, and accumulated organic matter it is how evolution moderated the surface temperatures and controlled the hydrology and created soil fertility. So everybody focusing on learning more and more about this is very important and understanding that as individuals, we really can't do this on a planetary scale. We have to do this and, and to understand that we have to act locally, we have to work locally at this, but we have to do it simultaneously on a planetary scale. It has to happen now. It can't happen. You can't defer this for 20 or 50 or 100 years. This is now. And we're at 8 billion people and we're going to 10 billion or, or, or 11 billion before it starts to, to decline. But the sooner we, we act to take care of everybody, the sooner there's women's rights and access to contraception and family planning. And in every place where there's women's rights, access to family planning and contraception, the birth rates are flat or in decline. Mm -hmm. You know, so the 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 population can go down, will go down. And so we need to understand that. We can't push it to the breaking point. We can't have wars. 
at this time. We have to have peace. So we, we have like a really big problem and we have a really big solution. And the majority of people all around the world are good. And this is the thing to hold on to because there are some pretty bad people, but they're a tiny minority. So let's all work together and make sure that we live in a peaceful, prosperous, flourishing, abundant earth. Now, that's what we have to do. So if you, if you want my thoughts tonight, that's what I would say around the fire. And also play music and feed everybody, take care of everybody and have a lot of fun. That would be the best, the best advice I had. Thank you so much, John. It's hugely inspiring and, and very relevant at this time when I think we're all just battling so much with the with what's happening in the world right now. And I mean, apart from the two raging wars, I'm also referring to the earthquakes in Afghanistan and all the other um, climate change induced um, extreme weather events that we've seen over the last year. We've almost gotten used to them. I mean, you see them on the news. I, I don't know if everyone's the same as me, but and you think, oh, another earthquake, another flood. Gosh, another flood, another flood in India. And you become almost, I don't want to say that you become immune to them, but it's becoming so commonplace. It's just getting scarier and scarier. And you're right. I mean, the time is now completely for, for those of us who know and who can share the knowledge with others and encourage others to join the movement and to take action. Um, really, there's, there's something that every single one of us can do in our personal capacity. Um, to to put into action the words that you've spoken. So really, thank you so much. I also want to thank Bob. Um, I don't know if I thanked you properly earlier, Bob, <laughs> really for your amazing, very inspiring presentation and and for your honesty also at, at, at you know coming at uh, it from many different angles. Um, I, I mean, we know that that running an ecosystem restoration community is not all rainbows and unicorns, and you've really spelled that out for us and. Um, and it's it's important to understand those challenges ahead and to but not to let that deter you, um, but also to ask in open forums like this for others for the advice of others. And I know there were a couple, quite a couple of questions that you posed. I've got your your um, your presentation and um, I'm going to make sure that we ask the right people and then we get answers in some form forum or another to all those questions. Um, it is really getting late now, guys. I'm sure you've all got some place you need to go and be. I, I thank you for your two-hour attention span. Gosh, you can tell they're not a lot of Gen Zs here with their goldfish attention spans. They would have checked out a long time ago. But really, thank you, everyone. Um, if you've got any last questions, you can pop them into the chat. Otherwise, unless anyone has any burning issues or thoughts they'd love to share, any last thoughts from you, Bob, before we, we sign off? Yeah, also, I, I want, first of all, to thank everybody to listen to me. And uh, yeah, please, I want to apologize for that one person. I think there was something wrong with one of the email addresses. But uh, I think for now, we should be able to, uh, I think we have received everything in the past uh, two months. So uh, it's um, all going uh, well. And I think on a positive note, and I fully concur with uh, with uh, John and it was uh, for me also very nice to hear it uh, straight from the horse's mouth uh, so to speak uh, very encouraging and uh, and uh, empowering uh, that, that we are doing something that we should try to find uh, a following and, and other people to do the same thing uh, but one positive note is that uh, I had put internship positions uh, in the Netherlands for both the fruit uh, plantation and the uh, reforestation project. All of them wanted to go to the reforestation project. And also now I'm getting the first Kenyan uh, students uh, who are also very keen on that. So let's uh, hope that, uh, let's say, the, uh, the new... Uh, uh, the new generation that is now in uh, university or on uh, in primary school uh, actually get the message uh, much uh, much better, and uh, I'm sure by yeah working better together between us and sharing ideas, uh, for sure we can uh, strengthen each other as a as a community and uh, make sure it uh, it grows. So th thanks everybody uh, very much, and uh, looking forward to. Uh, 
get in touch or uh, stay in touch. Thank you. Would you mind if I just added one thing? Thank you again, Bob, for that. It's wonderful. And I would just suggest that you try to reach out to Marissa uh, Pulaski at Dryland Solutions. Uh, no, no, uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, Dryland Agroecology Research in Colorado. And this is one of the ecosystem restoration communities. And they have something really quite special. They have a kindergarten program. Um, basically, they, they started calling it farm school. And they were training and, and working with um, really the, the neighbor's children. I mean, all the children in the, in the region on the, it's called the, the Front Range. It's near Boulder, Colorado in Longmont, California. And it's just extraordinary. All the people love hiking, biking, rafting, and skiing. And the place was burning down. I mean, really, they had this horrific, they had fire tornadoes, you know, this kind of crazy outcomes. And um, they, people were just not prepared for this. It was being, wiping out these very wealthy communities and homes and so on. And so here's this little group doing agroecology, which they can see over a year, two years, three years, five years, that is having massive in increases in biodiversity, biomass, and soil moisture, soil fertility, and productivity. And they're working with the landscapes. So they're doing their own lands and they're advising others to how, how to do this. And then, the, then all the people started bringing their kids and then their kids are going there. And so that brings all the parents. So then all the parents are, are visiting, are bringing the kids every, every day to the kindergarten. And they're basically staying outside all the time with these very compassionate young people who take care of the kids. And they're moving that program now from kindergarten into, into elementary, going all the way up to to sixth grade and then they're talking about moving it up to middle school and, and to high school and so that the next generation and i watched them raise almost half a million dollars in two days from their community it was quite extraordinary um and they did it just by saying and they had a big party and two big parties uh, one one big party, I, I, I went to the first one, I just couldn't imagine this was happening, but they had the Native Americans speaking, they had political leaders speaking, they had the parents of the, of the children, they had all the people who are running farms and ranches who are saying like, oh, we have to do this. And then like all the people said, well, we have to support this. And they just physically said, okay, we'll give five, 10, 20, 30, 50,000, you know, and it's just like they got on the first time 170,000 and on the second time 250,000 in two days of, with parties with their, from their communities. So this is quite extraordinary. And this is what needs to happen everywhere around the world. And the communities and the people who are impacted, they're the ones who understand and need to participate. And they need, more and more we need people who are conscious of this and understand it, and we need them to lead because they're the ones who care. They're the, the ones who are doing it and they're the ones we have to learn from and they're the ones that we have to follow. <laughs> We have to join with them and do what, what uh, we all can. So that's all I wanted to say. Talk to Marissa. She's a really good uh, 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 contact for you. And I see you have a gecko on your wall. Yeah. 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 Uh, Bob, I'll connect you with Marissa via email. Um, okay, fantastic. Great. Thank you.
Okay, guys, we're going to call it a day. Last chance to say anything or thank you, everyone who's participated. It's been a great, a great fireside chat. And we look forward to seeing you next month. In the next couple of weeks, we'll send out our, our date. It's usually on the second Tuesday of the month. Um, we had to do it a week later this uh, month for different reasons. Um, but we'll, we'll soon be sharing who the, the guest restoration community will be for our next session. And for now, I wish you all a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, um, whatever follows. And thank you. Thanks for being here, everyone. Thanks, John. Thanks, Bob. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, John.